сейчас я хочу представить вам Патрика, который затронет сегодня очень интересную а, проблему, я не побоюсь этого слова, проблему громкости, проблему мастеринга и вообще человек, у которого есть свой лейбл, свой саунд-дизайн лейбл, э, э, он занимается также помимо написания музыки, как играет как диджакей, он еще, конечно же, занимается мастерингом. И сегодня э, он не будет ничего показывать, связанного да, с диджейством, сегодня будет разговор о звуке, о том, какая катастрофа творится с... Э, закликанными, запиканными треками, что происходит и куда вся эта катастрофа движется. И вы сегодня это все послушаете и поймете, как, в принципе, должно происходить. Поэтому давайте поприветствуем еще раз Патрика. Yeah. Are you ready? I am ready. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers. So, I guess everyone's here. Hello and welcome. My name is Patrick Garopedian, or Patrick DSP is my stage name. And uh, I'll be presenting a master class on mastering and well, the mastering process and the loudness wars because they kind of go hand in hand. So let's begin. Uh, this lecture that I'm giving is basically designed for people who are a bit more advanced who actually have done production and are on the stage of actual mastering and putting the final polish on their music. That's what the mastering process is. So what is mastering? Uh, mastering, and this is taken from Wikipedia, mastering a form of audio post-production, the process of preparing and transferring recorded audio from a source containing the final mix to a data storage device, the master. That's the definition. Short, that just basically means preparing the audio for the final destination. Basically, the mastering process is and should be to make the music sound better than the original. Bottom line, nothing else really matters other than that. It so has to sound better. And mastering should also make each song balanced compared to the other ones. Say, for example, if you're making an album, you shouldn't have one song sound very bassy or very loud, and the next song after that should sound flat and quiet, unless they're very different styles. Say one's a ballad, but that's another choice. Uh, basically, you should have cohesion, make everything equal. And uh, so basically, what does mastering require? It requires critical listening, uh, And there are software tools that help you uh, listen to music better, such as analyzers, uh, meters, uh, spectrograph, oscilloscopes, all these little tools. But essentially, if you do not have the ears, you don't have very good listening skills, you're not going to be good at mastering. Leave it to someone who is professional and does this for a living. Don't try to do everything at home. You don't have to. And the results depend on also the accuracy of your speakers and the room as well. You can be able to, you, you may have the best hearing in the world, you may be able to pick out, oh, this is a C, this is a C-sharp note, and you may be able to have, do that, but if you don't have the speakers, you're not going to be able to hear because your speakers can't make those sounds. Your room can't make those sounds, and you can also have the best speakers in the world. If you put them in a bad room, they're still going to sound bad no matter how much money you put into that room. And also mastering engineers, even though they put in uh, the panels, the bass traps, the corner traps, they sometimes, and most of the time, to be honest, they apply corrective equalization to basically fix the room. Say, for example, if we cover this whole room with foam, it's just going to sound foamy and muffled like this. They, they usually put a hardware EQ between their system and their speakers to actually counteract what the room does to give you a flat response. So what is the process chain? Um, how do we do this? How do we go about mastering? There are a number of software programs out there that let you do mastering. We're not talking about that. We're going to go old school. We're going to go the right way with hardware and why, and why all those pieces of software are trying to emulate the pieces of hardware. And this is what we're going to talk about, so the mastering chain. And also know that these are just guidelines. This is not definite. You shouldn't always do this. It depends on the song. Every song is different. Every room is different. Even our own personal taste is different. Do what works well for you, the way you work, and the music you're doing. So, as I was saying, this is the basic uh, processing chain for mastering. It's suggested, it's not a rule, do what you want, make it sound good. Okay. So, the first thing we usually do is gain. We turn up the volume, turn up the gain technically, uh, just to get an even response for the song. And then from, from turning up the gain, it then usually goes through equalization. And then after equalization, we get compression or bus compression. This is just to go in the master chain It doesn't have to do anything special. And then finally limiting, just to make sure we're not destroying our equipment, essentially, and bringing up the volume even more, pushing it. And I said we're going old school, so we're going to put it on tape. But to be honest, you could just put this on a computer as well. What's the processing chain? The advanced process, more de detail. Gain as well, bring it up, equalize it. Stereo processing, this doesn't usually always have to happen, but more often than not, it does. And later on, we'll talk about the difference between stereo, left and right, uh, compared to MS, or mid-side, mid, 
side. And then after that, we have our compression, either bus compression or multiband compression, depending on what's needed for the music. And because we compressed it, we need to bring up the gain again. Okay? And after bringing it up, we're going to add our own personal touch because mastering is not just a science, it is art. So we will add some soft clipping or some special processing, such as saturation, warmth. Uh, we'll use exciters, expanders, whatever we feel that the track needs to make it sound better than the original. And then we'll do some limiting again. And our lovely tape machine. That's our chain. What do you need? The best monitors you can. If you can't hear it, how do you know what you're doing is right or wrong? If you can't hear a certain frequency range, you're guessing. And in this process of music production, it's, it's very delicate. Uh, we're talking about changing um, certain settings by like half a decibel, even less. If you can't hear what you're doing, don't try. And also to go along with the best speakers you can afford, well, there we go, a treated room. Because you can have the best speakers you can afford, but if you put it in a bad room, it's going to sound bad. If you take good speakers and you put it in your bathroom, it's going to sound like a bathroom. If you take the best speakers in the world and you put it in the garage in a parking lot, it's going to sound like a parking lot. It has to be a good room. What technically is a treated room? A room that has a flat EQ. Basically, if I put in um, six decibels or minus six decibels of 100 hertz, which is a bass frequency, I should get 100, uh, sorry, uh, six decibels, minus six decibels of, at 100 hertz coming out of the speaker. In a certain room, if you guys sing in the washroom and then when you take a shower, sometimes you hit certain notes, it sounds very loud, it sounds very quiet. Uh, a treated room with a flat EQ, all, all your tones are going to come out at the same volume. Okay, and uh, to go along with the flat EQ, it's a stable room mode. What is a room mode? Well, basically, when the sound comes out of a speaker, it hits a wall, and then it comes back again. When it hits one wall, that's axial. Uh, axial room modes is the technical term. And basically, the wave will come out of the speaker like this, hit the wall, and then come back out again. But if they're crossing, sometimes you have phasing, cancellation, and other times, uh, Yep. Room modes, basically it increases the volume. So if you're standing in the center room, a certain frequency might disappear, but if you move a little bit over, it will explode. And uh, taking care of room modes, it's, it's impossible to get rid of it, is unless you throw in thousands upon thousands and thousands of dollars in the room, and, but it's almost near physically impossible. You just basically have to control it as much as you can and realize that you've gotten as close as you possibly can to be acceptable for the way you work. And uh, you also want ro low RT and waterfall. Now, what are those? Low RT stands for low reverb time. Uh, basically, we'll use our, wa our washroom ex example again. When you speak and you have your sound reverb ringing from the walls, it sounds like, well, it probably sounds like what I'm sounding like now with a little bit of reverb. And uh, in a treated room, if, if you generate a sound, if you clap, it's pretty dead. Uh, whereas in, in a room with a very large reverb time, it, that clap goes on forever instead of going psh, it goes psh. Uh, sorry for the sound effects. And also, uh, we, we also want low waterfall. Basically, what low waterfall means is uh, it, it has to do with the room modes and how quickly a sound dissipates. If, if we make a, a certain sound at a certain frequency and, and we only do a slight pulse, we should have that sound dropping off right away rather than the room exaggerating and continuing it on even longer. So that goes along with. So, uh, and the reason why it's called waterfall is because the graph that's used to chart it actually looks like a waterfall. And what else do you need? You need trained ears. Uh, just like uh, when you learn a new language for the first time and you start speaking it, your ears are not trained to actually be able to hear the slight differences that another language is producing. And then you start to get used to it and you have more experience with language. You're like, oh, okay, that's how you pronounce that word. I've been pronouncing it wrong all the time. And just the same way, your ears need training too. So you need experience with it. Right. So, and also with experience with sound, you also need experience with uh, well, sound and, and the equipment to use it. Yeah, if, if someone comes to you and like, oh, I need more compression, you really shouldn't be looking up the manual for your compressor saying, oh, how do I do that? How do I reduce it by two decibels? And how do I give it more punch or attack? You really not need to know it. It's an extension of your arm. It's part of your body. It's your setup. It's your own personal space. You should know how to use it. And uh, I'm a very honest, blunt, straightforward type of person. One of the things you need for proper analog mastering or just good quality mastering because you can use digital aspects of it as well. You need money. It's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, this whole process of mastering, it's very it's nerdy. It's geeky. 
it's very technical in some aspects, but you also have to remember, you need to have fun. You, uh, people come to you for your style of mastering because you add a certain flavor, a certain whatever that they can't get at home or this certain mastering house is not able to get. They like the, the sound that comes out of you because you add your personal touch. Have fun with it. It's as, mu it's as much art as it is science. What equipment do we need? We need an analog digital, digital analog converter or commonly known as a sound card in for consumer grade, but professional grade, they're called converters. Okay, so uh, just an example of, of one of the converters. There's a Lynx Aurora 8, and that's what it looks like. It's nothing special. Here's another one that I really like. It's a Crane Song uh, Head uh, 192. And uh, basically, they're expensive units. They're, uh, th both of these are just over $2,000 each. And essentially, I'll use this one. Ha -ha. Uh, so you have your word clock in and out. That's for stability. And uh, this section here, that's your digital inputs and outputs that goes to your computer or whatever machine that is sending out a digital audio information. And then you have your analog outs and your analog ins, and that's all it is. There are a, a number of other converters that offer more features, more ins and outs, or other bells and whistles, different sampling rates, different ways to control jitter, um, how stable that clock is. But essentially, this is what they do. It's, it's a very specialized machine, just like all the other machines for mastering. They're specialized, they're highly tuned, uh, very carefully picked out components inside to make sure you have the best of the best to get the best sound. I'm going to run through all the equipment in the way that you would run it through the chain. So this is the, this is the converter or the sound card. And one of the things when the sound is coming out of the sound card, you need to be careful of inter-sample peak detection. Digital audio is created by taking pictures uh, of sound at a specified frequency or sampling rate, usually uh, 44.1 uh, kilohertz, or 400, sorry, uh, 44,000 uh, times per second, your computer is taking a picture of sound. So uh, say you imagine a runner, and he's running through a finish line, there's a camera that's taking pictures while he's crossing that finish line. And these snapshots are joined together by predicting uh, a smooth curve from jumping one step to the next, basically. That's this. These are your snapshots, boom, 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 and a computer reproducing the sound says, okay, if I do the steps, it's gonna sound very digital. So I'm gonna impose an algorithm and I'm gonna join these up. So I'm gonna go from midpoint there, midpoint there, midpoint there. Obviously, this is a very basic algorithm. They're, they're very smart and realize, okay, this is this type of sound or this is that type of sound. I need to use this type of wave or mathematical equation to determine how, how the wave should have been. Because of that, Sometimes you go over limit and you get clipping. So this is why you need intersample peak detection. And the reason why you need intersample peak detection rather than regular meter is because these things are so fast, they, they occur generally about the time frame of, of one sample. Whereas a meter usually needs at least three samples over a limit to say, hey, you're clipping. This catches it really quick. To avoid these peaks, we need to have lots of red uh, headroom. So turn down your volume. So we use a digital limiter designed for intersample peak detection. The, the reason why we can use a digital one is because this is in digital domain. This hasn't left. The sound card is still all inside your computer, so it's fine. To, actually, you're supposed to use software because analog is not fast enough. So we have, we have a meter to detect it, so it shows us if we're actually going over. There's a regular meter, and then there's our inter-sample peak detection, and it tells us where, which bits and, and, and what's call it are, are moving about and if they're peaking or not, uh, because this is way too fast for, for analog. This is happening for one sample. Uh, a regular limiter, the fastest I've seen, even a, even a software limiter, uh, the standard kind, it takes about three samples to go over before it actually clips anything, or it tells you it clips anything. This is uh, there's a plugin called uh, XISM, and it's by Solid State Logic, which is a fantastic company, and uh, it's free. So how do you write it? We, we've taken care of it. It's about ready to come out of our, our converter. So where does it go from converter or sound card? So from the sound card, the converter, it goes through, well, if I was a, p a pianist playing piano, this would be my centerpiece. This is always in front of me. It is my monitoring console backbone or, and insert switches. And so uh, here, here's some examples of, uh, of, of mastering consoles, uh, monitoring consoles, backbones, and insert switches. Uh, a brand, Dangerous Master, is fantastic. And, and basically, it's a very simple box. Uh, you have your inputs, you control the volume, you have your output for input monitoring volume, and then you have your width and uh, your output, and as well, you can turn your inserts on and off. But I'll, sh I'll show you more in a bit. 
Now, this machine only allows you to have three inserts, and that's why you sometimes need a, their add-on, which is their insert switch. And so with this, we can actually uh, ha have more inserts, so that means more compressors, more EQs, different types of compressors, different types of EQs, multi-many EQs, whatever we want, whatever we have in our studio, we can hook that up. And this is a really nice one because not only does it follow the chain of one through six, you can have it go back and say, okay, I also wanted to run through it again because I like that compressor setting or whatever. It's how you work. It's, there's no real right or wrong way. Just make it sound good. Uh, so, and here's another example. It's a manly backbone. It's essentially the same thing. So from here, you can, you can pick your, uh, your source, which, which channel it's coming in and out of. You can select your, input, uh, your inserts and turn them on and off. You can adjust the, the panning or the mid and side and the volumes. Uh, so this is what the back looks like. It's a, l a little easier to understand because it's hard to read the ones. So you have your inputs, your, sorry, your, yeah, inputs, your inserts, and your outputs. So with this one, you have your three inserts because this is for the master, the, the dangerous master. So two different inputs you can have. Uh, say one's a computer, the other one would be a DAP machine, tape machine, whatever. Uh, your inserts, EQ, uh, left and right in, or out, or send and return, um, compressor, left and right. And then you also have different types of, of outputs for different monitoring systems. Say, for example, you have multiple uh, a speaker setup, or you want it to go out to this room or that room. Uh, basically, this box lets you have the option to interconnect all your equipment without having to go around and unplug everything and plug it back in. And this is just hit a button, and it's there. And it's also with this machine that you would have your, your um, stereo panning and uh, your, your width control. OK, so after that, we have our backbone set up. We want to EQ it. We want to take out certain frequencies. We want to boost certain frequencies, such as the, the mid-range or bass or whatever. This is the EQ section. And uh, the, the point of using hardware EQ is to give it flavor. We can use a softer one, and it's just going to sound very clinical. We want to pick the right EQ to give it the right character. Say, for example, we want to use a, a manly massive passive because it's more of a rock piece and we want to give it a bit of extra grid, better, better mid-range. We use this type of EQ, or if it's a different style of music, we'll use a different kind of EQ for the character that it also gives. And also remember, it's as much art as it is surgery because with an EQ, you can really home in on, on a certain frequency, but you also want to use your intuition. If uh, you shouldn't spend all day thinking, oh, should it be like 0.1 dB more or less? or would this sound better, that sound better? Go with your gut and just let it happen. Put your personality into it. Okay, so here are some examples of some mastering EQs. So we have the, the Chandler Curve Bender. And that's what it looks like. It's actually based on the designs that they used in Abbey Road Studio, which you may or may not know is an awesome mastering house in uh, London, England. Did all the Beatles records. And, and here's another one. It's a tube tech, uh, pull tech type EQ. Uh, it's a pull tech heavy EQ is a different kind of EQ. Uh, basically attacks certain uh, frequencies in a different way. It's, it's more set to certain frequencies. And whereas, whereas the Chandler one is a stereo EQ, it's got your left and right, the Pultex and mono one. So if you want to do stereo work, you would need two of these. So uh, this would be your low frequencies. You would pick the frequency and turn up the gain. It's, and it's pretty much set. You, you can't pick uh, in between frequencies. You, you go with let's, let's break down equalizer, because I don't know how familiar you guys are with, with equalizers, especially this type. It's a really exciting class, isn't it? So it's actually a lot simpler than you think. So let's just pick one side because the other side is the exact same. First off, we have, we have our high pass. Uh, th these, are, these are the frequencies you can pick. You've got your low end frequencies, your mid range presence, and then your high end. And from there, we can, we can pick the frequency. We can then pick uh, how much we want to bring it up or bring it down. And, and when you can, actually try to EQ things down. Take, take things away that you don't need rather than push what you want up. You get a much cleaner response. So yeah. So, so Take things you don't want away rather than push things up because when you push things up, you still have the stuff that you don't want in there. So essentially, this is pretty much kind of the same design as, say, the EQ you would have in Ableton, but it's more set to certain bandwidths. But this is like um, $4,000 EQ with proper components, very meticulously picked, and they're set to certain frequencies that hit the right sweet spots generally. And it doesn't have to be this one. It could be uh, any other kind of EQ. I love Manly's. Uh, Elisa's is also a good one. So uh, I, I keep talking about stereo and mid and side. What is that? Well, ask Wikipedia. Uh, stereophonic sound is a combination of left and right channels representing our two ears. MS stereo is short for mid-side stereo. <clears throat> it is obtained by inverting the phase of, the <laughs> of one of the signals before combining it to 
to them left and right. So basically, a mono signal is just one channel. It's the left and right added together. But if we take the left channel and we have the right channel and we flip it and put it together, they cancel out if it was a perfectly mono signal. But if there was any other information or something slightly different, we get the difference. We get the side information. And uh, so, so that's how you get the side information. And, the, and the, the mid or mono information is just left and right. They're still in the same phase. Put them together. It's mono, just like pressing the mono button on your mixer. So making one channel the center mono, uh, channel and the other stereo information. And this way, <coughs> and the reason why this is so important and, it, and it's used more than adjusting the left side and the right side, especially when it comes to mastering, and the reason why we use this more is this, with playing with mid and side and, and adding different effects, or sometimes in extreme cases, to be honest, adding a different type of compressor or setting to the stereo information rather than the mono information. And, and what I mean by balance is if we affect something on the left side. Uh, say, for example, we're playing with an, with an EQ setting, and it's, it's an analog knob, and we turn it by hand. So anyway, so uh, say, for example, on the left side, we're, we're, we, we play with a knob. It's an analog knob. It's not digital, so it's not giving a readout. It doesn't say point, blah, 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 frequency. It, it's, an, it's, it's an approximation. It's very funny. And, and on the right side, we can only look at it and get kind of close. We were eyeballing it. But if, if they're slightly off, we're going to have a balance feeling. Say an extreme example, we, we make the, the left channel with more bass than the right side. Well, we're going to walk around like this in our headphones. And, uh, and with playing with mid and side instead of left and right, we're able to set, a, set an EQ setting for, for the mids or a compressor setting or whatever effect that we want to do for the mids and have it different on, on the sides. And it's still going to feel together. It's not going to feel balance pushed one way or another, right? So that's how this is useful. So, yes, and we can control that with the backbone or the console that we have, compression. So I take it most of you guys are in the school, so I don't need to go through the, all the settings of what's ratio and threshold, so I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt of that. Uh, unlike uh, compressors that you would use for producing track, uh, a master bus compression is to add cohesion to the elements of the mix, basically to, to make everything sound smoother and join together. And it can be used to exaggerate elements of the music depending on the type of compression settings that you use or add more character because it's, it's hardware, it's analog, it's the reason why you're using it is to add that color. It's not, it's not meant to be so clinical like it would inside a computer. It's to give it that character. You, use a sp you buy a specific brand of compressor, you use a certain setting to give it that feeling that you want, that warmth, because combining all the different elements, that's a lot of information, yeah. combining everything together make, gives you your sound. And uh, we should use this with care. We don't want to use really extreme settings. This is, the mix is already done. Uh, it should be a good mix down already. Certain channels should already have their own compression. So use this with care. It's to add flavor to the mix. You're using hardware or hardware emulations in some case with software, uh, if you want, to, uh, to add flavor to a mix. You don't want to squish it. You don't want to make it sound too loud. Anyone can make a loud mix. It takes a real professional to make it sound nice to listen to. Uh, an example of a compressor, or mastering bus compressor, would be the Manly Il Elo. Oh, there we go. Ta-da! There we go. And as you can see with this compressor, it, it, it looks a lot different than the ones you, you're more used to. There's no attack ratio. There's no, uh, well, there's no attack, there's no ratio, there's really no threshold, there's no release. So basically all you have is the gain, the input gain, to turn the volume up, and, and also the, the uh, reduction on here. The, this, this is because everything in this box is set at a certain, a certain frequency, or sorry, fr um, certain uh, ratio and threshold already. So, so turning it up is the same thing as bringing down the threshold in a regular, in another compressor. And that's why I use it, because it adds character. You, you want this old school kind of flavor, and Manly's redone it with this style of compressor. So uh, another example is the API 2500, which is an industry standard. So with this one, you have your threshold, attack, ratio, release, and also secondary release on this version. Uh, you can link them together for side chaining, uh -huh. and basically you pick this because you're familiar with this equipment, uh, you like the sound, and you want it in your arsenal. And honestly, if, if you're spending this kind of money for these kinds of compressors and EQs, you're going to do your research, you're going to figure out if this is the sound uh, it makes if I run this mix through it, you maybe borrow it or demo it from a local shop, and you, you figure out what you want in your arsenal. And next, we have multiband compression. So multiband compression uh, splits the signal into uh, different bands or different frequencies. And you can have different uh, compressors or compressor settings depending on the frequency. So, and, and it's great for basically digging in and surgically adjusting a, a piece of music by having a certain compressor setting for the bass frequencies or the mid-range 
and not touching the rest of the frequencies. Because, because if, if we use the, just a regular bus compressor, then everything's going to get squashed the same way. The hi-hats are going to get squashed the same way, the synths are, the vocals are. So with this, we can actually get into it and, and basically... Uh, here's an example. So with this, we, we set the frequency ranges. So this, this one controls the high, and this one will be low, and so we set the two areas. And there's only two knobs, not three, because, well, if you have a piece of wood, and you only need to make two cuts to make three. And, and basically, the settings are the same in this, in this drummer model. So we have our threshold, our attack, our release, our gain, and uh, our mute and our bypass buttons on that. So basically, it, uh, you have your compression settings, and they're pretty much all the same. It splits into three and joins it together. And we have our gain control and our balance control left and right, and, and also our, ba our balance control with left and right. But if we, uh, if we send one channel uh, mid information, the other, other channel side information, then the one left side would be controlling the, the center channel, and the other channel, which usually is the right side, would be controlling the stereo information. You wouldn't really want to do that with a, with a, with a multiband compressor, though. Fol following our process, what's the next thing that we want to do? And uh, we want to put some flavor in your ear. So, and that's basically to add your personal touch from experience to make the sound sound better and more polished. But to be honest, this section is not really done so often because uh, you, you pick your EQs for the sound that they make. You pick your compressors for the sound they make. You, you pick the sound, um, sound card, the analog digital converter for the sound that it makes. You pick basically all your equipment for the characteristic of sound. By the time it's passed through everything, it already has a good character, or it should. Uh, such as the tape machine, you yeah, maybe give it some saturation. This is a very old tape machine. I don't have one of these. They're big, they're heavy, they're very expensive, and they break down all the time. So basically, it's to add analog warm, such as tape saturation, and uh, just, just to give the mix better cohesion. It's, it's like overdriving a mix in an analog domain, just to smooth things out, smooth out any rough bumps. And if you, if you have a tape machine, this might be your last step. This is where you would record it, and then dump it back to your computer or however, whatever medium that you want to record on, whether it's a vinyl, whether it's MP3, or whatever. And, and there's also a lot of uh, software emulations that are actually very good. Waves is doing one. I think Universal Audio also has a very good uh, DSP um, a software emulation of tape saturation. So. so we also have monitors because we want to be able to hear what we're doing. So here's an example of some of the features you want to look for when, when buying uh, mastering grade uh, monitors. And to be honest, this is probably going to be the, if you are getting into this, this is probably going to be the most, I, the most expensive item that you'll, and that's because you can't fix what you can't hear. Some of the features you want to look for is basically a, a three-way. It's a, it's a type of bass response for a speaker. Not, most speakers are two-way. And uh, full range, so basically it goes from very low to very high, and their and need to read to hear everything. The best monitors still depend on your room and your ears, because if you go to parties all night long, don't expect to be a mastering engineer because you're going to hear all night long and all day long and for the rest of your life, and that doesn't go away. And, and if you're wondering how I do it, I, I've, I have filters, I have earplugs that are molded in and bring all the decibels down, 25 decibels. And just to be safe, I don't do anything on a Monday. So here, here's an example. This is a, an ATC SCM50 ASL. That's the, that's the model number, and ATC is the brand. And this is a big boy. It's massive. It's, uh, it's a three-way monitor. It could be considered a... a it uh, has a frequency range of 38 hertz, which is, you can get some that are lower, but this has a very flat EQ you know, to 22 kilohertz. The bass driver is 200 watts, the mid-range is 100 watts, and the tweeters are 50 watts. Loud music is a drug. So this is where I, I talk about how everyone is able to make loud music. It's, it takes art and experience to make good music. But a lot of people confuse loud music for good music, and there's a reason for it. It's actually a scientific fact that loud music actually releases more endorphins and uh, adrenaline into our bodies from our brain when we hear loud noises. And, and basically, this is, this is old back when we were cavemen. When we heard loud noises, that meant dan danger, and our brain said, hey, let's get out of here. Basically, our brain, our brain flooded our bodies with adrenaline, endorphins, trying to wake us up, get us alert, figure out what's going on, and get the hell out of there. But the unfortunate side of things, Mastering equipment, audio equipment, audio software, it's a, it's a lot cheaper than it was a long time ago. So a, any, any kid in a basement can go download an illegal software and push the volume up all the way and think, oh my god, it sounds amazing. Um, so a lot of, like I was saying, a lot of people without training or the ability to hear or they, they don't have the right equipment, they, they confuse louder with better because of this. 
and because everyone is able to make louder music and almost everyone here could t technically have a record label if they want willing to pay 10 euros. So basically the music industry is flooded with a lot of amateur recordings and everyone says, oh, this is louder, this is louder. And people play, and l louder music does get more attention. Like that's why commercials are louder on TV. It's basically the equivalent of me yelling in this room. I get your attention right away. I but unless you're in into death metal, I doubt you'll really be liking that. Why am I talking about this? Because of the loudness wars. And what are the loudness wars? Basically, it's a movement by the AES, or Audio Engineering Society, to bring awareness to the audio le levels in the entertainment industry. That's radio, TV, films, everything. They're just reaching dynamic levels that are just way so high that it's most of the tracks out there, most of the music, most of the films are just pure distortion. And uh, long periods of loud music tires out the listener's ears very quickly. Thus, you don't want to listen to it very often that long and basically you just turn off your radio, you turn off your TV, turn down the volume of everything and you just do something else. Uh, basically this chart shows the dynamic range of certain released albums. So basically what dynamic range is the difference between the loudest volume and the quietest volume in, in a mix. Uh, what that basically means is you have a very loud kick drum but then the decay comes all the way down so it sounds very nice. It sounds I can't make a kick drum now, but you get the idea. Rather than everything just sounding at the same volume with no dynamic range, it would just sound like right? That would be a song with no dynamic range. And uh, Justin Bieber is actually louder than Metallica, because there's Justin Bieber with a dynamic range of six decibels. That's six decibels difference between his, his loudest sound to his quietest. And there's Metallica with dynamic range of 11 decibels. So, and uh, here's another remastered Metallica one, dynamic range of three. So uh, you can also see chronologically over the years how it's, it's changing. Like this is 85, 84, 88, 77, 87, 97, 2007. And louder music has been proven not to have any effect, pos well, positive effect on sales. So here's a better example of dynamic range. Uh, dynamic range, as I said, is, describes the ratio of the softest sound to the loudest sound in a musical instrument or a piece of equipment, and is measured in decibels. Um, so let's just read this meter really quick. There's our peak range at the top. There's our RMS, which means root means squared or average. And then there's our dynamic range. And that's a dynamic range of 9.6 in this example. And most music shouldn't, uh, in, in the AES, the uh, Audio Engineering Society, basically they say most music should not exceed eight decibels of dynamic range. And that's why in this, in this meter, you actually have it marked off at minus eight decibels and minus 14 decibels. Yeah. yeah. And that's why this is slightly yellow because I guess the track keeps on moving up and down. And if it went past eight, it would turn red. And if it was a bit lower, it would be green. But no one really follows the rules all the time. So a lot of music on Beatport or you would download or, or whatever, a lot of electronic music is usually around six to five decibels of dynamic range. As you can see, everything uh, keeps getting squished and squished. I just want to remind you, be a leader, not a follower, make music better, not louder. So, so why am I emphasizing the difference of volume and keeping things quiet and, and, and basically just trying to do better instead of making things louder? That's, that's because Louder is actually quieter in 2014. Uh, iTunes and other uh, music delivery formats for digital, digital music, which is basically how almost everyone gets their music. No one buys tapes. No one, well, not that many people buy vinyl anymore. And, and we listen to our music mostly on our iPhones when we're walking around. And, and all those digital providers actually have an algorithm in them called uh, automatic song volume adjustment or automatic gain control. So basically it's a dynamic uh, value added to each digital song uh, so that when your player, your phone, iTunes, when it plays music back, everything is at a consistent volume. Actually, I made a mistake. It's not the same volume, it's perceived volume. And so this is an example in iTunes. And you'll see here, it took this Michael Jackson black or white song and it said, hey, this is too loud. I need to lower the volume by 5.2 decibels. And these settings are turned on by default for everyone in the world. And in Europe, there's actually a law uh, to limit personal uh, audio devices to a set amount of 80 decibels output. And uh, Tractor also has this option as well. Just to give you an ex example of what it was and what it is now in this loudness wars and how music keeps on becoming louder. Here's an example of Michael Jackson's black or white song. And it, I, all I did in this example is I raised the volume so uh, their peak volume is the same of minus 0.2 decibels. So in this first example, we have black or white from his history album. I spelled that wrong. Uh, from 95. And also the remastered 2004 version. And this is what it looks like. 95, 2004. I don't know if you can really notice, but you can see in that first snare that happened there compared to the volume there. 
and how much detail is missing on this one. Lots of dynamic range, not so much dynamic range. And iTunes has read, read these files and said, hey, this is still too loud. I'm going to reduce the volume by 5.2 decibels. And this one, I'm going to reduce it by 8.1 decibels. So after adjusting the volume, this is what it actually looks like. And you tell me which one you think is louder. It's a big difference, isn't it? So when you play back this in your iPhone, it's going to be a lot quieter than this, even though it's the same song. And this one's supposed to be remastered and going to sound louder. This one's actually going to be playing louder. And because of all the, the compression you use, this is actually going to sound distorted. So what to do? Make it sound better. Constantly compare it to other examples, other commercially released uh, tracks. E even though I say the whole mastering war is all about, or the loudness war is about uh, being, making it louder than everyone, understand that even though they're pushing it louder or another commercial release is louder, go for quality and listen to the quality of this stuff. Get your stuff to sound as, as beautiful but without squishing it. They, they have their own volume control on their device. Let them turn it up if they want it loud. Now, uh, with, with all this education, you have all this equipment, and all this experience you have, uh, no matter what, you're still working for someone. You're still working with a client, and you have to communicate with the client. So, and get an idea of their expectations. That's what we do at, at Neptune Studios with mastering. Get an idea of what they want, get their file, and also ask for, what do you want it to sound like? What, what other release, commercially viable release, would you like this to sound like? Because with mastering and all these tools, we can push the volumes or EQs and, and craft the song to sound very similar to any other song there is. You need, you need to let them know what's possible. If they give you their, your, their very first track that they've ever made, and you're like, yes, this is awesome. Make me sound like Tiesto. No, sorry, bad example. Uh, but basically, uh, you can only make something sound better. So if the source material is garbage, you're only going to make better garbage. And, and don't be afraid to teach the client um, ab about the process, about what would make their song better in the mix. Because uh, a, lot of these, a lot of people that give you music, they're artists. They're, they're not involved in every aspect of the music industry. They, they just want to write music and express themselves. So, so it's actually better to actually talk to uh, the person bringing you music and say, hey, I could do this for you, but it would probably sound better if you, say, cut off the bass frequencies from your snares or, or EQ your hi-hats in this way and, and get a better mix down, and then I'll master it, rather than mastering everything that's given to you and you have a low-quality product in the end, and they're not going to come back. M most people, when you tell them how to make a better mix down, how, how to provide better music, they'll thank you, and it'll be a rewarding experience for them, and they'll most likely come back to you again for future work. Thank mm -hmm. you.